Hello and good evening everyone. I'm Ella Townsend from Hub Midlands Young Talent Coordinator. You're about to watch a recording of a BFI Film Academy lab session on developing stories for different formats by award-winning virtual reality filmmaker Alex Rule, presented in partnership with BFI Network. This session is for aspiring filmmakers who are interested in telling stories in different ways beyond the traditional cinema and looking to explore the possibilities of XR and VR filmmaking. BFI Film Academy Labs are all about helping 16 to 25 year olds break into the screen industries. These monthly practical sessions are led by industry professionals with a focus on explaining the specifics of working in the film and television and developing your skills to become the best screen creative you can be. The labs are programmed across three strands, which are storytelling, business of film and career ladder. We hope you enjoyed today's session. I'm Alex Rule, and here today in 2023, I am a writer, director, and primarily a VR um, creator. Um, I <laughs> had the slightly absurd privilege of uh, debuting my latest VR piece, Rock, Paper, Scissors, at Venice Film Festival last year. And it was a really surreal moment because Timothy Chalamet was on the red carpet about 40 minutes before me and my other kind of fellow XR creatives were. And I just like this moment right here, I mean, you can see literally in this image, I've just got my back to, <laughs> to the cameras because I'm taking selfies because it was such an absurd moment for me in my career. And to look back and think, how on earth did I get here with this little virtual reality experience that I created? So I want to tell you that story to begin with. I want to tell you about how I got to here, to this moment. And then I want to talk about how the actual piece, Rock, Paper, Scissors, that landed me here on this red carpet was made. And then I want to talk about broader, like how, how you can look to get into um, XR creative, not just virtual reality, but beyond that, augmented reality, mixed reality, you know, beyond these kind of traditional square, rect uh, sorry, not square rectangles, beyond these little glowing rectangles that we use for our traditional screen industries. There's a world of possibility out there. And I'm super excited to hopefully inspire some of you to be on that journey uh, with me from here on out. So how did I get here? Let's rewind, shall we? So I studied television production at the University of Leeds from 2009 to 2012. Now, during my last uh, kind of summer break between second and third year, I actually started working very randomly in a warehouse to, to, to kind of get money to pay rent. So I was one of those people that could kind of like, you know, go up and pick your packages and then pack them and then get them shipped off to you. Um, and I did that for uh, for this whole summer. And uh, towards the end of the summer, I um, was chatting to this other kind of like per the student that was uh, working this job. And he happened to mention that um, uh, his cousin or a friend of his cousins worked in television. And I was like, oh, so funny. I really want to work in television. I would love to have a chat with them. Long story short, had this really interesting conversation, managed to uh, get some kind of um, experience shadowing this producer for Sky Movies. And lo and behold, that kind of, you know, catapulted me into the, the kind of the television industry. Because off the back of that work experience, I then got onto a talent scheme at the Edinburgh International um, uh, Television Festival. Uh, where I won a pitch to win an ITV Studios internship. Uh, it was a really interesting pitch, actually. We were pitching game show ideas, and I had the really naive uh, question when we were pitching of, what if they really like my idea? Like, who owns that IP? And I think they thought, hey, um, you know, if, if this girl's asking these kind of questions at the age of uh, 20, um, maybe we should give her a go at the actual proper, <laughs> the actual proper development. So, Worked at ITV Studios um, for a bit, then moved on to uh, when I graduated my first kind of proper TV job where I was um, working in a very small independent TV company uh, coming up with ideas for factual entertainment. And I remember again, I, you know, recent graduate, tw uh, two, I was 21, so 2012. And um, it was funny because I made, I kind of came up with this idea and I thought, like, has anyone just like sent this to Channel 4's commissioning editor? Like, has anyone done that? And they were like, you know, even the exec producer on the team was like, no, you, don't, you don't just send an email to the commissioning editor. And I was like, oh my God, 
not? Why not just give it a go? And I did, funnily enough, I did send an email to, at the time, the commissioning editor of Factual Entertainment, this idea for a, a TV show that we'd come up with. And uh, we managed to get a pilot funded out of it. And that was a hilarious and bizarre experience. And again, that was kind of this another kind of uh, catapult into the into the world of TV. But after a while of coming up with ideas, um, I thought, hey, what about like making the stuff? Like, right, I've, I've got the kind of development stuff. Like I know like how, what ideas work for TV, but actually how do you make it? So um, I uh, jumped on a few different productions, the most notable being um, Junior Paramedics for uh, BBC Three. And it was there within about 48 hours of working on my first 14 hour shift in production. I was like, nope. <laughs> not for me um so it was a really interesting time because I kind of felt like I'd bounced around even at the age of I think I was by that this point like 23 into my tv journey and by this point I was kind of like I don't really I don't know whether tv is for me you know I've dedicated my whole career my whole life up to this point trying to you know trying to kind of climb into this industry and I'm I, I don't know something's not quite gelling so I did what anyone does I moved to Canada and um, reflected on my life choices. And it was there that I really kind of connected back into like what I actually loved about TV in the first place. And that was storytelling, right? Like remove the medium, remove kind of um, the kind of the, the actual technical side of it. What I really loved was telling stories. And so whilst I was living in Canada, I started writing a, a little script. And at the time, I thought it was going to be like a kind of a, a TV pilot. But I actually kind of about three months into that journey, discovered virtual reality for the first time. A friend of mine put me into one of these really kind of janky looking cardboard things that you would just like slot your phone into. Um, but that was enough of an ex a wow experience for me to be like, oh, wow, there's like this whole other medium going on right and this was kind of 2015 where VR I think at this time maybe Facebook had just acquired Oculus or that was like a really kind of you know Oculus was just becoming a big thing for those of you who don't know Oculus was you know one of the 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 kind of biggest um, manufacturers of consumer grade VR headsets now they you know they were acquired by uh, Facebook at the time Meta now and is now probably the most widely sold VR headset the the Meta Quest um, but at the time, you know, all of a sudden I saw like this kind of really interesting format that no one really knew how to tell stories for. And that kind of got me. I was I was in from that moment. So I took that little script that I wrote in uh, Canada and I started playing around with what would it look like to make that in VR. And I started chatting to some of my like TV friends, like people that worked in traditional TV, one of them being uh, a BAFTA award winning director, Chloe Thomas, who's phenomenal we started thinking like what should we just make this and should we like go really bold and just ask some like kind of like really amazing actors to be involved even though we had no money no real idea what we were doing well flash forward and that project that script um turned into key delight which was one of VR's first kind of rom-coms and it starred Gemma Whelan who you might recognize from Game of Thrones and Natasha Karam, who has gone on to be a phenomenal uh, kind of star in the US, starring in um, 911 Lone Star. And this little project, which essentially, you know, I funded on a credit card, basically, and we just got favors and roped in people for free, you know, with the kind of, you know, caveat of, well, you know, maybe it'll be this fun little experiment that we can all do together. Um, and lo and behold, this this kind of film like blew up my career in a really amazing way. And all of a sudden people were looking to, to kind of me hilariously to tell them how they should be making VR films. And the more I started thinking about it, the more I started kind of thinking about, OK, well, well what does make a good VR piece? Because at this point, not only had I made you know this piece with Chloe, but also... I'd uh, set up Cats Not Peas, which is my production company. And we had been kind of like starting to kind of create little VR experiences for brands. So I was starting to get a sense of what did and didn't work and what, what felt good to watch in a headset. And I was, you know, viewing all the content possible um, and was really kind of soaking up a sense of like what my style was in, in VR. Um, 
it was a really interesting time. I'm going to play you a very short clip um, of Keed Like. So that's just a super short video. You can tell that we had no budget. <laughs> um, although hilariously, the uh, the friend that we roped in to, to film the behind the scenes brought along a red camera and we were filming on, you know, the VR kind of like camera was like these four little GoPros stuck together. So I thought that was absolutely hilarious that like we had like, you know, cinema grade epic camera doing behind the scenes <laughs> and we were filming the actual experience itself on GoPros. Um, so yeah, flash forward, you know, another few years. So this is 2019 now. Um, you know, I'd been kind of working in the kind of commercial uh, VR space, cutting my teeth on how to be a good VR director, uh, but also kind of getting a sense of what was going on in the Midlands in terms of who was working on VR stuff. And uh, I connected with Ben Fredericks, who those of you in the Midlands, if you don't know Ben, you need to. He's brilliant, you know, very philosophical uh, kind of storyteller, visual artist. Um, and he was telling me about this really exciting project he was working on at the time, which essentially was this thought, thought experiment around, you know, if you were in, if you were the captain in charge of a spaceship during a humanitarian crisis, like how would you deal with that? And what decisions would you make? And drawing parallels to the refugee crisis. Um, so I kind of, you know, very kind of quickly was like, how can I help? I want to be involved in this project and kind of take what I'd been learning in VR and the kind of, especially on the distribution side and how you kind of play at festivals. Um, and brought that to this project. So I ended up EPing this project with Ben. I'll show you a quick clip from this. It's very short. Where is Adelaide Colony 3? It seems a little point trying to help people that don't want to be helped. To sit here and watch an entire colony be destroyed and we have a power to do something. And do what exactly? It's a difficult decision to make, but what do we prioritize? So what was interesting about playing God specifically is this was the first time that I kind of was exploring storytelling outside of a film specific context, because Kida like, you know, very much photorealistic filmed on cameras, not very good cameras, but, but cameras nonetheless. Whereas flash forward to playing God and playing God is both. It's photorealistic, you know, film of these characters, but projected into a 3D environment. And all of a sudden, you know, Ben was exploring a lot of kind of game mechanics and game theory around like, you know, interactive choices. And actually he was the first one that really started sowing that seed to me of like, what does it mean if you give your audience control of the story? And how do you then, um, you know, how do you allow for that? Like if someone decides option C, how do you change the story to make sure that it reflects that they chose uh, option C, right? And, and same, if they chose option A, like how does the story differ? And then when you think about that from a production point of view, oh, all of a sudden you've got all of these branches, it can get really, really interesting and complex and expensive. Um, but it was a real eye opener and I love this piece. And we actually premiered this piece at Cannes Film Festival in 2019 um that was a really exciting uh kind of experience flash forward to kind of you know late 2019 and at this point you know I'd written and produced my first piece I'd EP'd for Ben and I thought I thought to myself you know I've been directing and writing my own work in the commercial space why haven't I taken the opportunity to do that with my own kind of original ideas you know, even though I'd written Key to Like, you know, Chloe was the one that directed it. And so I started thinking about like, if I were to direct a piece, what would that piece be? And, and how might I go about that? Um, so I pitched the idea uh, to BFI Network and uh, gracefully um, they funded Rock, Paper, Scissors, which is essentially a um, and interactive VR experience where you step into the memories of a daughter uh, and, and a mum's kind of coming of age 
uh, journey together. And I'm gonna play you uh, a short video, which uh, was kind of made for its premiere at Venice Film Festival. And this kind of gives you a glimpse of behind the scenes, a bit of the concept, bit of behind the scenes of how it was made. Uh, and ultimately, obviously um, not being possible without BFI network funding. So I'm gonna play that now. Do you remember the moment that you realised your parent was just a human being? You know, just trying their best with the, the hand that they had been dealt in life. Well, Rock, Paper, Scissors is about that moment. I remember mum teaching me to play rock, paper, scissors like it was yesterday. It's a simple coming of age story where you step into the memories of a young woman named Priya and you get to see her relationship with her mum evolve over time. It was like my mum's way of making it seem like I had a say in things growing up. With Rock, Paper, Scissors being the core mechanic that drives forward the narrative, we used the latest hand tracking technology on the Quest 2 so that you could actually physically play the game with your own hand. And with that, I think, comes this extra level of immersion and agency over the story. Our developer, Mia, probably spent the most hours out of everyone on this project, making sure that from the second that you put the headset on, you are guided through the experience in a way that's totally native and authentic to this story. If the game is called, you have to play. Don't push it, Priya. Mum, you are the one who made the rule. Every bit of art in this project has been created by the incredible VR artist Rosie Summers. And the thing that I love about Rosie is that she really takes the time to understand the meaning and the tone of each individual scene. And so we were able to bring to life these imperfect memories that each have their own very distinctive style and details that grow more vivid over time. That day I realised why Mum liked us to play the game. This project would not have been possible without funding from the BFI network. This is actually the first time BFI network have funded a virtual reality project. And I'm so proud that we get to premiere on such a big stage at the Venice International Film Festival, because what that will do is that will open up this whole world of opportunities for the future generations of filmmakers that want to jump into the immersive mediums and experiment. You win some, you lose some, kiddo. So on behalf of me and my team, thank you so much for taking the time to step into the world that we've built for Rock, Paper, Scissors. So, yeah, what a wild ride, right? From 2011 to 2022, was when Rock Paper Scissors premiered. Uh, and before I move on to this uh, very <laughs> clickbaity <laughs> slide, um, just to kind of reflect on where that project has gone now. So since premiering at Venice, um, I signed the piece to the largest immersive um, distribution company, Astrea, um, who are based in France. And the piece is now, I mean, I, I, I I don't mean this as a humble brag, but I genuinely don't know how many festivals it's played at because there has been so many, which is it's so exciting for so many reasons, not just for the project itself, but for the fact that there are such growing uh, audiences for this work. And more and more festivals are understanding how to showcase it well, how to give people the opportunity to showcase their work. Um, and it's becoming a really, really exciting uh, medium for storytellers to explore. So for that reason alone, it's super exciting. But um, you know, it's really kind of, I think it's good for you to know out there that once you make a project, it doesn't, you know, you don't just, you're not just alone, right? There are distribution companies. Yes, they are so uh, in their infancy compared to traditional film distributors, but they are there and there are kind of revenue streams that can kind of um, continue to fund your your kind of ongoing work. And we can talk a bit about, more about that later on. But, you know, this slide, I feel like, um yes is a bit is a bit kind of on the nose but I do love to think about this in the fact that you know, a lot of people ask me like am I too late because I mean I've you know obviously been working in this medium for nearly a decade now already 
But hilariously, I would say that today, November 2023, uh, is still the best time to be jumping in and exploring this. And that's because in, in comparison to where it's going to go, we are so early. We are in the wild west of working out what this medium is, what it means, what it means to audiences, how to tell stories, how to direct, how to write, how to develop. Um, and that's super exciting to be amongst a group of like pioneers shaping this stuff. Uh, you know, one of the real, real things that I love about the creative space when it comes to VR and XR in general is the collaboration, like the community aspect very supportive people helping you on this journey. I remember when I worked in television, I felt like it was very lonely, like it was very like siloed because there were a lot of gatekeepers, there was a lot of hierarchy and it was very cutthroat in terms of like people trying to get, you know, their next contract, which is which is fine for a mature industry. But the thing that I love so much about the XR space is it's so collaborative. It's so kind of open and sharing. And, you know, there's community meetups and there's kind of people that will help give advice like on your project or, uh, you know, people willing to kind of, um, yeah, lend their support. It's a really, really cool group of people. Um, so what do 2023 and 1895 have in common? Well, you know, some of you might recognize this image as like the, the piece from the first ever motion picture, which, you know, according to legend, had audiences running from the cinema because it was so, you know, they'd never seen something like this before. The fact that the train was moving towards them made them think, ah, <laughs> run, danger. And uh, when you think about where the, the filmmaking language in traditional cinema has gone since then, you know, it's absolutely wild to think how much has changed and how mature that storytelling language is. Well, if you think about where we are in, in immersive, um, that's where we are. We are day one, really, compared to where this is going to go, in my opinion. So I've been using the term XR a lot. I just want to kind of let's dive into some of the technicals on like what that actually means. So XR stands for extended reality. And that is the kind of blanket term for immersive technologies, right? An immersive experience, something that goes beyond just your, yeah, your traditional kind of uh, 16 by nine screen. So on the one hand, you've got augmented reality. So, you know, here is kind of a a TikTok filter, for example, is augmented reality. So if you're interacting with a TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, you're most likely using augmented reality already in your kind of uh, daily life. My personal favorite as like a, a kind of a side note is the um, iPhone measure app. Don't know whether anyone else has used that, but essentially if, you, if you've not got a tape measure around, you can literally use your phone to overlay a tape measure anywhere very handy before a trip to ikea um and then the on the kind of other end of the spectrum so you've got augmented reality on one side you've got virtual reality on the other side virtual reality just means that you are fully encased in a virtual environment right so whereas augmented reality is about overlaying a digital experience onto your physical world Virtual reality is all about stepping into the full immersive digital experience. So you are encased in a fully kind of uh, digital environment. It takes you somewhere else, right? Whereas AR is very much about real life, just overlaid. And then in the middle, you've kind of got this, you know, what some would argue is called mixed reality. Me personally, I think mixed reality and augmented re reality are kind of the same. But mixed reality is, is kind of where all of the big kind of tech companies are putting all of their money. And that is kind of like the hybrid experience, but through a headset. So this image that I'm actually using on the right hand side is not technically VR, it's technically AR. Uh, and this is the latest uh, MetaQuest 3 headset that just got announced and launched um, last month. And what you're seeing here is, you know, a, a kid playing with digital Lego. So that ability, imagine, like, imagine how much money parents are going to potentially save <laughs> on Lego um, and the plastic that's going to be saved by having it digital, uh, just being able to see it through um, a mixed reality device. So that's a slightly more immersive version of what you can do, like on TikTok and Instagram. But, you know, the point is that these technologies are becoming a bit more commonplace. Like right now, it might feel to you if you've not used VR before, or if you've not, if you don't own a device, or if you don't know anyone that owns a device, it might be like, well, you know, how big a market is this actually going to be? 
But already, if you look at AR and the kind of fact that I think it's something like 7 billion uh, AR filters are used every single day on TikTok, there's this huge kind of like market opportunity. And this technology is like really evolving rapidly. And it's only going to get more that way, right? Not less, more. Um, some of you may or may not be aware that Apple are about to release their first ever XR device. It's the Vision Pro, and it's going to be coming out in America, I think, early next year and then Europe later in the year. And this will be Apple's first kind of flag in the sand that they believe that this is the future. And actually, the, the kind of the term that Tim Cook used when he introduced this product was that he believes that spatial computing is the next evolution of computing platforms. Um, now, you know, this device specifically, the thing that I think is so exciting from a storyteller point of view is that during the keynote, they announced that Disney Plus would launch on this device when it ships. And some content um, from Disney Plus has kind of already been augmented into this slightly more immersive experience. And it's not really that much of a jump, right, to go from, you know, experiencing something quite immersive in an app to actually Disney coming out with full blown uh, immersive experiences themselves. I mean, um, Disney actually, uh, I think they invested in a company in 20 back in 2017 I think called Jaunt which sadly doesn't exist anymore but it was kind of the Netflix of VR at the time and in that they had all of this amazing kind of IP like it was just probably a little bit too early to be honest but I can see that like with Apple coming into the game this is going to open up a whole new world of opportunities right now don't get me wrong this device is going to be three and a half thousand pounds so it's not going to be something that everyone's going to be rushing out and buying but more it's more so the signal from apple that they are investing in this and they believe in this so whether it's you know uh today working on like a meta quest device which is you know roughly about 300 to 400 pounds or an Apple device in two years time that might look a bit cheaper and a bit more kind of evolved. Either way, this stuff is here to stay. So again, it's a really good time to be kind of exploring this. So I did mention that I was going to talk you through like rock, paper, scissors, like how, how we kind of built it, how I kind of came up with the concept, how, how it kind of, we went from paper to, to, to headset. Um, so I do want to talk through that. And you kind of got a bit of an idea of that through the, um, uh, through the video that I played. But let's start with the concept. So this is a really, if, if there's one thing to take away from this lab, um, when it comes to VR storytelling, it's this. If you can just remember this and filter any idea through this premise, you've got a really solid starting point. So a lot of people ask me, how do you know if an idea is good, like for VR? Or, or XR in general, but mainly for VR, like that's the most immersive kind of way of telling a story uh, in XR. You know, how do you know? And I basically boil it down to this principle. It's it's either a story that means you're going to be there or it's a story where you're going to be them. So what I mean by that is, is it a story where the location itself is in itself a character, Right. So that could be anything from like, for example, I don't know, somewhere, a story set somewhere that you'd never, ever get to go. Like, I don't know, Antarctica, <laughs> to just pluck something out of my head or space, right? Like somewhere where it's like, it's so unlikely that I will be able to go there. The idea of being able to step into a headset, be fully immersed and actually be transported to that place is really exciting. And because of the nature of the medium of VR and the fact that it is kind of, you know, it's fully 360 and immersive, you've got this really beautiful ability to kind of like, almost like the storytelling language starts with the location. So you can kind of like the way that you set your, uh, address your set, the way that you kind of have your lighting, um, the closeness of everything, it, objects in the scene, like that all makes an impact in terms of how someone feels. Right. Because when someone puts on a headset, they essentially are stepping into your world. And similarly would be them, you know, the idea of putting someone in someone else's shoes. 
the idea of telling a story from the point of view of someone that you'd never, you know, maybe you've never kind of like, you would never be able to um, really communicate that person's story or really get a sense of like how that felt without being in an immersive medium. That's also a really good starting point. And that doesn't necessarily always have to mean first person point of view character, but you can do that. I mean, I tend to do that for quite a lot of my pieces. Um, it could also mean being a, a kind of a, a, an observer of a situation in like a really uncomfortable kind of moment. It could be, you know, exploring what it means, you know, to, to be first person, having to make decisions that impact others. It's it's a way of kind of like giving someone that emotional connection to a character right from the start because you don't have to build it. It's just automatically there because it is literally like stepping into someone else's shoes. The next thing that, you know, so from, from Rock Paper Scissors perspective, I personally love the kind of like first person character point of view. So I knew that I wanted my my kind of audience to feel like they were the main character. So in Rock Paper Scissors, that is a character called Priya, who is a, a kind of a young woman reflecting back on her childhood and her relationship with her mum. The next question and I realize that these are quite like technical questions, but this is this is how this medium works, right? You have to think about these things up front before you start making the idea. Um, how do you want your audience to experience it? Because even though it's VR, um, there's multiple ways, right? Someone could just sit in a chair and kind of like, just like look around and be able to experience it. That works really well for some pieces. You can have someone standing and kind of like feeling a sense of like, you know, that slight um on edgeness that you feel when you're kind of like standing in an environment or you could have someone literally walk around the scene you could have someone physically interacting with the scene so these are all kind of options in virtual reality for me i actually wanted to build something that could work in any of them so i knew that in my head i knew that i wanted to tell a story about you know a mother daughter relationship I knew that I wanted it to be first person and I knew I wanted it to be the kind of experience that could be could be experienced in lots of different ways um, for a few reasons. Number one, for accessibility. And number two, uh, as kind of second reason is because if it could work in lots of different contexts, it would have a better chance at being um, accepted at film festivals. Because one thing that is a very heavy, uh, what's the word? consideration on film festivals that program virtual reality is space so some festivals like venice they have lots of space they have kind of like they want every experience to feel like its own little world like they really like you know it's literally set on an island that's where the immersive exhibition is on its own little island that you get a little boat to whereas some other festivals you know um they have a set room and they have a set amount of headsets and all the pieces have to play on those devices in that context or it can't be shown. So I wanted to build a piece right up top that could kind of cater for all of those different kind of scenarios. So rock, paper, scissors is as good, in my opinion, if you sit and play the game rock, paper, scissors. It's as good if you want to physically walk around this scene and kind of like see the kind of memory come to life around you. Next is scripting. Again, this is a this is another one that people ask me about all the time is like, is there a difference when you script for, for VR versus traditional film? The answer is yes, because especially if your piece is interactive, uh, you have to account for lots of different uh, eventualities, right? So you can hear in this script, um, you know, if I just kind of uh, read through it just quickly, like, halfway through the page, uh, Lena says, you know, this is how you do rock, you try kid. And it says, if user doesn't make a fist, then Lena says, try making a rock with your fist like this. When a user does make a fist, Lena says, perfect. Okay, so rock beats scissors. Scissors appear in front of the user to smash. So it's kind of like I'm I'm having to write into the the, the script, the different possibilities. And that includes, you know, later on in the script, you know, if if the user wins the game, then the character says this and this happens. If the character loses the game of rock, paper, scissors, then this happens. So, you know, you can get really fancy with this. And some people I know, you know, use like these kind of quite elaborate, like, you know, I don't even know what this is called, decision tree, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and kind of map different scripts to different things. And there's like software that you can use. 
I just use Google Doc and I just write it out like, okay, so if this happens, this happens, this happens. So keeping it simple, but essentially, you know, and this, this principle is the same as in filmmaking, right? Is that you've got to paint a really good picture. So someone that reads this script will know what it feels like to be the audience, right? So like, what is the user kind of seeing? I remember when I wrote Key to Like, you know, the first paragraph is about, you know, look around you're on, you know, you're in, a, you're on a kind of a, a lakeside in London. You know, behind you is this. Up above you, you can see this. Like in front of you, you can see this. There's a sense of blah 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 blah. And to your left, you see a character, and this character's name is blah blah blah. So being really descriptive about your environment and also where these people, where these locations, where these things are in relation to you wearing the headset. Um, <clears throat> next in the process of rock, paper, scissors, once the kind of script was finalized, um, and I should say that I co-wrote this script with a, a really good friend of mine. Um, and we kind of bashed this out in probably, I think we came up with the idea in like, uh, like an afternoon and then we bashed the script out and we have like a first draft of it within like one day. So it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't need to be like an overthinking process. Yes, you go through the edits and yes, you kind of like, I, I kind of would force her to <laughs> run the lines with me out loud we would get our a-level drama on uh to to hear what it sounded like and you kind of you know edit there but nothing super fancy just kind of like bash out a version of the script and then let's get kind of like into production so um again totally different for filmmaking in filmmaking obviously there is very set standards on what cameras what audio gear blah 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 for me, because the process of creating a VR uh, experience is quite iterative, and what I mean by that is it's not just script, production, post-production, distribution. It's more like a game in the sense of it's script, lock in the idea, lock in the script, and then it's build a, a bit of it and see if it works, and then test that with some people. And then if it doesn't work, change it, and then do another iteration. Okay, now we build out the next scene. Okay. What did we learn from that first scene? Did people understand that they're supposed to do rock and not, you know, did I remember there was um, a really funny um, kind of thing that we picked up on early on where uh, people were doing, uh, you know how like when you play rock, paper, scissors, you tend to do this with your hand, right? You like do the kind of the bounce motion. And what was funny is like we hadn't accounted for that when we'd done a first pass so every time people were bouncing their hands like the tracking on their hand was going all over the place and it didn't know what to read so just something like small and silly like that that if you if we had gone through the whole production process without testing that we wouldn't have known to kind of incorporate that into our elements uh, um i put here you know who needs expensive sound gear and that's purely because we recorded the first pass of audio on iphone just on the voice memo app you know, just kind of like each individual line, cut it up just so that we could throw it into the games environment and just start to hear it and start to kind of bring it to life. Um, 3D art. So again, very, very different to the filmmaking process, but in kind of rock, paper, scissors, you've got two core components. You've got the programming side. So the unity build, the interactivity, and then you've got the artwork. So all of the artwork for rock, paper, scissors was actually hand-drawn in VR itself. So you saw in the video earlier, um, Rosie, who's a phenomenal VR artist, like she's creating all of this in VR, uh, including the characters and the kind of different environments. Um, so that was really good fun. And essentially what happens then is, is, is Mia, the, the Unity developer would then take that 3D art and bring it into Unity, which is, a, is the kind of games engine that we use to kind of create. And, you know, in this, uh, she's creating like animations for like all the different pieces. She's kind of creating things coming on and off. She's programming the interactivity and she's also coding in that kind of branch narrative of if this happens, then this happens. Uh, and then, yeah, interactivity, again, the last piece of the puzzle, getting that really, you know, especially like the thing I love about this piece is the fact that people are using their own hands, right? So you put on the headset and it's your hands that you see and that instantly creates this real bond with kind of like the character you're about to become and it allows you to feel really real agency over the story. User testing, again, like this is done throughout, but once the experience is finished, 
we would user test the hell out of it because we need to kind of plan for every eventuality. So again, a really funny thing happened was when actually Ben Fredericks, who I worked on playing God with, I got him to user test it. And he was being really, really stubborn. And he was literally doing rock for every single one. And we found that there was this very strange bug that happened when someone did rock like three times in a row, just broke the whole thing. So it's really interesting. So such a weird, wonderful experience creating for this medium, because there's like all these little bits that you just have to account for as you go. Um, this, by the way, on the right hand side, this image is... Um, is me in Venice doing rock, paper, scissors. So you can see like the kind of the, the, the glam that they put on for these exhibitions. So you kind of like have your own little uh, kind of three by three um, circular area that's kind of enclosed by, by curtains. Um, yeah. And then distribution, like I said, uh, I signed with Australia. Australia is like probably the largest and most, you know, kind of established and, and prestigious uh, immersive distribution company. There are others. Um, they kind of cover off. And, and if anyone's just curious about seeing some really good VR pieces, highly recommend diving into their library because there's some there's some really, really nice pieces. Um, a lot of them have premiered at the big festivals. So always good to kind of like have a look at those and get a sense of like what um yeah, what festivals are looking for or or what is a kind of piece that uh that would be, you know, ready for a distributor. And again, for me creating this piece and, and, and a conversation I had with uh, with Alex um, from BFI Network when we were kind of building this was like, the thing with VR is because of the fact it's, you know, quite a new medium, a lot of the stuff made in VR is quite serious. Like it's quite documentary heavy and it's quite serious subject matter, um, which is great. And I love that. And that is partially due to, you know, the, the kind of legacy fund uh, funding landscape before BFI kind of like started funding work. Um, so it does lend itself to that. But I just wanted to make a piece that would make people smile, make people kind of like, you know, feel like, oh, you know, think about their parent, think about their kind of childhood, just wanted something that was kind of like a little bit more light. And so I knew that there was a big gap in the market. And there still is, by the way. So if you are a filmmaker that makes kind of comedy or, you know, something a little bit uh, more lighthearted, there's definitely a space in, in, in the kind of immersive world. So very quickly, because I know I've only got about 10 minutes left uh, before we jump into um, some Q&A. Um, wanted to very quickly blitz through, like, what's the difference between film and VR? And I have kind of drawn this out as we've gone. So hopefully that's starting to kind of resonate. But, you know, the number one thing I would say that's different is that you do have to do a lot of that kind of like thinking about the tech up front. You have to think about your audience up front. Now, you could argue actually most filmmakers should probably do that more right thinking about like who's the target audience like what is my distribution plan before you even start uh, as much as it would be lovely to go off and make a film about anything and think that there's a market for it sometimes you do have to like do that kind of slightly producery uh, reverse engineering but in VR specifically you just have to do that it's just like you can't even make a, a VR piece without thinking about the tech first so that's number one. Number two, like I said, it's a very iterative process. It's a lot more like game making than, than it is filmmaking when you're building in these kind of 3D environments. For traditional kind of like 360 filmmaking like Key to Like was, so my first project, in a way it's kind of more similar to film in the sense of, you know, once you filmed it, you filmed it and that you can't, there's no such thing as fixing it in the edit with a with a VR film uh, if you've actually filmed it in 360. Um, but you still have to do a lot of that kind of like, you know, choreography and blocking and um, that kind of testing of like, if I put this action here and here, is that going to confuse my audience? Will they know where to look? Or do I need to kind of make sure that actually character A crosses the screen um, and that's going to allow my audience to follow them. You know, there's a lot of kind of like thought that goes into that. Um, and then quickly, like the, the challenges and the rewards. Again, I've kind of highlighted these as we've gone. The number one thing I would say that is a challenge, and it's something that, you know, I'm really keen to kind of help address even just um, with my kind of EP hat on, is that a lot of new people in this medium 
will find it difficult um, to make a decent piece of VR on the kind of funding you're used to for a traditional film, because there's just so much more consideration, right? Like there's there's so much kind of arguably less distribution than a traditional film, and it costs a lot more to build it um, because of the nature of the fact that essentially you need a 3D artist and a games developer and, you know, or if you're traditional, if you're making it in film, like you need a 360 DOP and you need to kind of have someone that knows how to edit 360 footage and all of that kind of stuff. So there are some challenges. I'm not going to say that there aren't, but the rewards really outweigh that. Like it, it again, like it's, um, feel like when I look at my career, uh, I managed, I think, to leapfrog quite a lot of, of my peers in traditional film because there is such a white space uh, in VR filming because not many people are doing it. And that's because it is quite hard. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to kind of like hear from more filmmakers who want to jump in. Um, I'm my inbox is open. You can find me online um, and, and send me any kind of, uh, you know, questions that you have around that, because I really want to reduce those barriers. And especially for filmmakers based in the Midlands, you know, I'm so open to hearing ideas um, and, and kind of lending support where possible. Um, so how do you get started? You know, realistically, um, there's like, very much free resources but they're quite time intensive so if you want to build something like playing god or like rock paper scissors really the two key things you need to kind of be looking at is like blender and unity blender is a free uh kind of 3d art creation tool think of it as like photoshop but 3d uh, and Unity, which is the games platform. Um, these are the two free resources where between them, you could create your own VR projects if you kind of like put sunk some time into learning how to use them. Appreciate that's not gonna be uh, easy for everyone, but that's, that's a good place to start. Or even if you know, have people in your network that have these skill sets, these are the skill sets you need. Um, on the kind of more, uh, you know, filmmaking side of VR, um, Apple have actually, I think it was, I don't know whether it's confirmed or if it was just a rumor, but apparently they have just released an update in their latest um, iOS that allows kind of, uh, if you've got, I think the um, LiDAR version of the iPhone to be able to create spatial video just from your iPhone. Now that's gonna be a total game changer because at the moment you need a specialist camera to create 360. Um, I just put this in uh, for, for funsies. This was one of my first ever 360 cameras that I owned, the little Samsung Gear 360. I think you can buy it on eBay now for like 40 quid. Records in 4K. I remember some of my early like experiments was like putting it in my parents' garden and seeing how long it would take for the cat to kind of like come and knock it over. And then putting that in a headset was absolutely hilarious to like have this cat coming up to you like absolutely massive it like really gave you the perspective of like being an ant or a mouse or something in the grass so again like super cheap uh cheerful 360 cameras you can get started with um there are more expensive ones obviously but this if you're gonna just get started and just start to kind of like cut your uh cut your shops on on 360 filmmaking that's where i'd recommend starting and then you know vr headsets you don't have to have the latest kind of Quest 2 or like you don't have to buy the Apple Vision Pro to get started with this stuff. Again, like I say, my first experience of VR was with this little Google Cardboard thing that I've got on screen here. And I think you can still buy these for like four quid off Amazon or something like that. So, you know, really cheap and cheerful. And then you just find 360 videos on YouTube or there's like apps on the app store that allow you. Uh, and this is for Android as well. Uh, that you can kind of uh, just download and then put in the headset and it kind of mimics what it feels like to be in VR. So all really like tangible starting points. Um, and then I wanted to talk about like where you can get access to this stuff. Where might you learn more? What kind of places can you go to to experience this stuff at the more higher end? So uh, Story Futures is um, a project run out of National Film and Television School at Royal Holloway University of London. And that essentially is kind of looking at, I mean, as the name suggests, the future of storytelling. Uh, so they run, um, they run kind of like uh, project bids, I think, that you can kind of like submit ideas for. Or if you're just starting your journey more realistically, they run courses uh, and kind of webinars and stuff that you can kind of sign up to. They've got a newsletter as well. So highly recommend uh, that. 
Um, the kind of key UK based festivals, because um, obviously there's tons internationally, but the UK based festivals that have really strong, world renowned, really kind of brilliant XR selections are Brain Dance Immersive, which has just gone, Aesthetica, which has just gone, uh, Chef Doc Fest, which is in June, and BFI Expanded, which again has just gone. So unfortunately, like for the rest of the year, I don't think there's anything major. Um, but Again, if you're based in the Midlands, especially, sorry if you're not, I'm sure that all of your uh, kind of independent arts venues will also have um, some, If even if it's just like one device. But I know that in the Midlands, Phoenix, Quad and Broadway all run, if not, if, if they don't own the devices, they will occasionally run kind of pop-ups or they'll have courses or they'll have like, you know, uh, little pop-up VR cinemas and things like that. So well worth keeping an eye on those. Um, and again, a lot of the kind of because this has historically been quite like a seen as like a visual arts medium, it's only really in the last kind of uh, four or five years, it's been a filmmaking medium, a lot of the kind of big galleries like Saatchi and um, uh, other kind of the Tate Modern, those kind of places, especially in London, have a lot of these, um, a lot of these kind of immersive exhibitions. So I recommend that. Um, so I've already covered this. Why explore it now? I've given you a million reasons. If you're not convinced by now, I'm probably not going to convince you on this slide. But I just wanted to say that for any of you who are thinking this is all well and good, but I don't want to sit and watch a film with a giant sweaty computer box on my face. Totally fair. Think that a lot of the time when I <laughs> sat in mine for too long. But it's worth knowing that this hardware is only going to get better, right? It's only going to get smaller. In fact, this um slightly grainy um image that i've got here is the ray-ban uh, ai glasses that have just been released by meta so this shows you like if you think about where meta are in terms of producing their hardware they've got the meta quest uh, 3 which is a mixed reality device right so that's the big white computer um now they've just released the ray-bans which are literally a pair of ray-bans with cameras in them so A, that's going to allow you to be able to record stereoscopically, right? So record spatial video, but also like this is where this is all going eventually. It might take five years. I don't know. I'm not uh, I'm not a hardware uh, developer, but eventually this kind of like big, you know, hardware is going to be as small as the glasses on your face, right? And then when that's the case, this doesn't become a matter of if, this is a matter of when in terms of like the amount of kind of uh, opportunity there is. So getting in now is a really nice way to, to kind of be prepared and have kind of cut your teeth on a few, um, a few VR experiences before it becomes so widely spread that it's just mainstream and it becomes as proliferated as the traditional screen industries. Um, so last one, I've talked a lot already, but if you want to hear me talk even more, I did do a podcast throughout COVID uh, where I talked on exactly what we've been talking about today, but really, really in depth. I did a whole series about how to uh, make an immersive film. It was following the process of kind of building out another VR experience, uh, which I didn't end up making. Um, actually, funnily enough, the project I was kind of pivoted <laughs> to rock, paper, scissors from. But the principles stay the same. Like, how do you write for VR? There's a whole episode on how you write a script, how you cast, how you kind of, you know, storyboard, how you kind of like think about approaching distributors. And then on the more commercial side, like how do you sell this stuff? How do you think about this stuff? And more high, high level, like why do you even want to be a filmmaker? Like, are you actually self-aware enough to know why you're in this industry? Because actually filmmaking in general can be quite hard. So you got to know why you're doing it in order to have the staying power. Um, and that's it. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and we can go to Q&A. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, for listening. Hope that was helpful. Thank you so much, Alex. That was really, really, really wonderful. And as someone who is petrified of technology and how it's going to go, no, that was just really awesome. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, the chat box and the Q&A chat box has been super duper busy and chatty which is amazing um so i'll go to the first question which was by sonia um who said rock paper scissors is a gorgeous looking experience love those hands um as you've been doing this for a while i'd love to know what your thoughts are regarding future proofing work um for example vr headset software and everything else changing so fast and your experience might not work um and your experience might not work in a couple of months slash in a year etc thank you 
Yes. Such, such a great question, Sonia. So on the 360 kind of side of things, so Key Like, for example, was actually filmed in 12K. And that is kind of like, it's quite standard for, for, um, for, for filming in 360. So on that side of things, it's quite future proof. Now, <laughs> would I want people watching Key Like in, in four years time where, you know, the, the hardware is really amazing. Not really, because I've developed as a filmmaker, but in terms of that future-proofing, um, that is kind of inbuilt into 360 if you film at that kind of high-level re resolution. So that's fine. In terms of rock, paper, scissors, you are absolutely right. Um, and the answer is it's getting better. So, for example, um, I built a piece for a commercial client in 2019, and it is still being used today, even on the newer headsets. However, the last iteration of the Meta headsets that came out did break it and it did require a little bit of work to, to redo it. So it's not it's I feel like we're at the stage now where uh, it's not fully future proof, but it's getting there because, you know, I feel like especially on the 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 kind of the VR headset side of things, you know, if you're building for Quest, you're building for Quest, right? And like, it's gonna, if, as they start to iterate the hardware, like it will still be kind of, uh, it will still be uh, usable on future versions. Whereas, you know, when I was making Key to Light, um, I think, I don't even think a, a kind of standalone headset existed that had the kind of power of being able to interact, right? It was literally, you could either do something that was, uh, and I see that Sonia, you've asked about this in a later question, like three off, right? So that idea of three degrees of freedom, AKA you can just look around and up and down, but you can't move in space versus now where the hardware allows you to literally walk around the room. And that back in 20, kind of 15, 2016 would have cost thousands to do. And now you can do that in a headset that literally costs, you know, this thing costs about, I think, oh God, blur. Uh, this thing costs about 300 quid now, I think. And like this would have cost thousands back then. So in that way, it's really quite future proof. That's what I would say. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. Um, Alicia, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, has, I know you've already touched upon this, Alex, so it might just be a bit of further exp uh, explaining and digging into. But Alicia has put, what equipment and essential essential toolkit would you recommend for a fairly load like conventional producer who gets to explore and understand the medium further and start creating XR stories? Oh, yeah, good question. Well, my first, the first part of that is really important, right? Like how to explore the medium. So I would say rather than investing in the equipment, it might be a good idea to just kind of, go along to one of these festivals, go along to one of these venues when they do a kind of pop up. Um, I know that there's like independent creators that kind of tour their own work. So I think um, uh, In Pursuit of Repetitive Beats is like a piece by a, a director called Darren em Emerson that I think is touring at the moment in the UK. So if you can get tickets to go see something, uh, that's probably cheaper than, you know, buying your own hardware. So that's what I would say to that. And again, like, even if you don't want to do that, even if you don't want to go out to a location to, to experience it, although that will be the best quality work, uh, you can just, for example, like YouTube 360. And even if you search, like, I think it's, if you search Meta TV, let me actually just see if that works on my own computer before I give that advice. But essentially, like, there is this whole app on the headset, which I would imagine, because it's all 360, I imagine you'll probably be able to have on desktop um it's not coming up with an answer when I'm googling that so but yeah meta tv or kind of 360 films you'll be able to see a lot of this stuff on youtube so for example key to like is on youtube um I think if you search inception vr key to like that was the distributor that I signed that to back in the day um you can actually just see it on youtube now I wouldn't recommend you watch it on youtube without like a google cardboard or something because it's not kind of meant to be um watched in that medium but it's 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 a way of kind of getting a sense of what people are making I guess is what I'm saying there and then in terms of starting to create your XR stories yeah I think I covered that in in that kind of slide but I mean if you can get access to like a cheap little 360 camera for like 40 quid um and again some of these arts venues might have their own um that you could borrow or like someone in your network might have one I know like a load of people that are into like sports 
you know, instead of having a GoPro, they tend to have a 360 camera now because it allows them to kind of capture and reframe the footage after the fact. So it might just be worth getting hold of one of those and just start playing with it and just seeing what, what you can do with it. Loads of free resources on YouTube as well to give you an idea of like what they're capable of. So that's where I'd recommend starting. Oh, I love it. Thank you, Alex. Amazing. Uh, Ryan has put, as someone com confident in writing in art direction, but looking, but lacking coding skills, how can I make my ideas a reality? Hmm, great question. Yeah, it's it's a tough one because with with art specifically, you do need to kind of bring it into a games engine environment. Now, there are kind of like, I'm pretty sure there's like low code in low code environments now. So you wouldn't necessarily have to be like a proficient Unity developer to be able to like build stuff. Again, I feel like there was a platform that came out a while back, but I'm blanking on the name um, that would essentially allowed you to upload your kind of uh, work and kind of preview it in, in kind of 360 or VR. There's also slightly different, but there's interesting tools coming out now that explore kind of, gen ai and how how you can kind of build like vr ready assets off the back of just like writing a prompt so there's a tool called i think it's called sky labs sky labs uh 360 let's have a look yeah blockade blockade labs skybox and essentially it it kind of allows you to generate 360 imagery based on pure prompt. So I was kind of like, I've started use, recently using that to kind of like think about like 360 storyboarding. So how can I storyboard something that's quite aesthetically in line with what I'm thinking of making and then quickly preview it. So that could be, that could be something interesting, but to be very, very candid, it is, it is still quite a technical medium. So the other thing I would say is get into the community, get like kind of connected with, other creators and then it doesn't matter like I can't code in unity I'm got a clue I would have a clue where to start if someone gave me a unity project but because I've been in the industry and because I've like kind of built up my network like people are so happy especially if it's a cool idea they're so happy to work with you on something right so I would also say build your network in this space reach out to people that are making cool VR stuff um yeah that's all that's also a really good route to go down Awesome. Thank you, Alex. Um, and then someone has put, does VR work well with neurodiverse audiences? Uh, yes. Great question. So I have ADHD and I find it um, definitely some experiences work better for me than others. It, it's funny because I didn't really make this connection until probably about a year ago when I was at Venice, actually. And I was kind of watching, <laughs> kind of experiencing some pieces that really like I just they did, didn't didn't gel with me right and I don't think that's because of the technology itself I think that's because of the storytelling the way that the story was quite slow and there wasn't kind of like there wasn't much to interact with and things for me personally didn't work too well um whereas I'm kind of a bit more like I want things a bit more fast paced I want to kind of interact with them you know that's that's kind of my neurodivergence but my uh, my nephew has autism and he loves some of the really simplistic immersive experiences so there's um there's this one simple one where essentially you're just kind of like it's like this this voiceover character is telling you kind of like what blocks to kind of build and like tells you a story of like these different blocks that you can kind of pull together uh, he loves it. He could spend hours in that thing. I mean, my brother definitely won't let him spend hours in this thing, probably uh, probably for the best. But so, I mean, that, those are only anecdotal experiences in my family of like neurodivergence. Um, but, you know, again, what's really lovely about this industry is because it's being built from the ground up by creators accessibility is absolutely at the forefront. There's a lot of energy and a lot of discussion ongoing in all of the groups that I'm involved with in, in every event in every kind of you know uh, in the independent kind of creative scene around making sure that we're building inclusive experiences and and allowing kind of you know making sure that everyone is catered for from an audience perspective and from a creative's perspective so hopefully that gives you some confidence great thank you Alex loads of questions coming through um Katya has put can you use cinema 4d instead of blender 
Yes, I think so. Again, I'm not a super techie person. I'm not a, a technical artist. Uh, my assumption is that you can build in any kind of 3D asset software, including I know some people create in like Maya and some people use, I think Unreal maybe has like a built-in thing where you can build kind of 3D assets. Um, again, not my area of specialism. You can definitely, I think it's just, a, it's a very standard format that you have to spit it out in to then be interpreted by the games engines. The one thing to know as a 3D artist is you've really got to be aware of your poly count. So for those non-technical people, you can switch off for a second whilst I address this, but essentially, because this headset is essentially um, kind of like a phone on your face, it doesn't really have the kind of computing power that a lot of kind of game makers are used to. So it will not be able to run, you know, on a standalone device, like a triple A game style, like aesthetic, right? So you have to kind of make things and, and you'll notice this as you see a lot of VR, a lot of stuff has a particular style, which kind of gets around the fact that like real photorealism, CGI generated, stuff, it, it just, it's not there yet in terms of, I mean, maybe the Apple Vision Pro will be able to handle that kind of stuff because, you know, I hear that the compute power is amazing on it. But for now, that's just something to bear in mind if you are going to bring your 3D art into, uh, into VR. You learn something new every day, don't you? There we go. <laughs> um, and Sierra has put, do you think 16 is too young to begin exploring the VR film industry? Should I carry on developing my style or using medias like VR? Oh, that's a really cool question. I mean, I, w I wish I was exploring this at 16. I mean, it didn't exist when I was 16. But um, I would say that, you know, these headsets are approved for people to use from, I think, actually, Meta just uh, lowered their age. Let me just, again, just quickly fact check myself before I commit to this uh, age requirements. I think they kind of lowered it. To, yeah, to to... 10 so as long as you're 10 and above then these products have been deemed suitable for you to spend time in uh some content obviously will vary um but as a hardware i think it's totally fine and i think you know if you're really i mean if if you're 16 and you're listening to kind of like a talk like this or you're interested i would say follow that instinct don't be afraid especially like one thing i would tell myself in my kind of teenage years is like this is the time to be like creating and having fun and like exploring stuff, right? Because when you get um, to my kind of age, like you get to the point where actually the you're, you want to be doing fully creative stuff, but actually you've got a lot more responsibility and a lot more strategic thinking around, how am I going to pay my mortgage? So like, um, so I think whilst you can, if you've got that freedom, definitely explore that and definitely don't be afraid. I know there's, you know, it's a whole other subject, generative AI, it's a whole other thing. We are going to see so much change in the next year. I know that there's been loads of movement in the film industry around that and putting tight, tight, you know, kind of contracts in place around where you can and can't use it. But what I would say is do not rule it out. It's going to be a huge part of the future in general. So play with it. Don't be afraid of it. Don't necessarily use it to write your scripts. Like it's not very good at that right now, but, you know, use it to explore. And like, again, like even like, um, I was actually building out a, a kind of proposal for a, a bigger kind of piece, uh, rock, paper, scissors kind of project. So it would be like an hour long, um, would kind of like have much kind of like higher fidelity graphics, would look kind of like Pixar-ish. And I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to see what this might look like. Like just, I just typed into, you know, one of these AI generators, um, you know, like make me a image that kind of is in the style of 3D you know, whimsical uh, Pixar style aesthetic. And, and it's two girls playing rock, paper, scissors with each other. And what it spat out was absolutely amazing. And it instantly got me excited and inspired to write my script. So I wasn't using the actual image. It's just that I was just, it just got me excited, right? Because all of a sudden I didn't need to be the one who had to spend hours and days and weeks building that design. I could see it and that itself inspired me. So yeah, really, really cool stuff to like look into. Definitely, yeah, explore it. Fab. Uh, we've got a really interesting question from Paul who said, what are some of the most interesting challenges slash, slash obstacles you've had to overcome when thinking about how people will physically experience films in 360? 
Yeah, I mean, my mind immediately goes to a really early project that I was involved in. And actually, I um, I gave a TEDx talk on this in 2019. So if you search my name and TEDx uh, and VR, it will probably come up. But essentially, in that, I tell the story of um, this hospice that I was making virtual reality experiences for. And so when it comes to like obstacles, but also, you know, kind of interesting challenges in terms of getting people into VR, you know, we were building VR experiences for people nearing end of life and especially people who had lost, you know, the ability to kind of like move, you know, some part of their bodies, you know, some were uh, kind of had um, diseases that had just kind of, you know, uh, eroded their ability to be able to interact with their hands. And so one thing early on was like, how do we make an experience that someone who is wheelchair bound, who can't move their arms, like who could, you know, how do we make something that is as, you know, amazing, as exciting, as immersive as someone who, you know, could theoretically walk around a scene and interact fully. And we ended up doing like some really simple experiences that were like totally mind blowing. And one of the, um, one of the experiences we built was like this very simple walk around Bradgate Park in Leicester and for this particular hospice kind of um patient who we kind of put it on like and there's a video actually of this from Loris Hospice of him doing that you see him kind of like just like taking it all in and then he starts talking about all of his memories of Bradgate Park and he talks about like you know oh look over there like I, and he's talking to us in the room as if we're also doing it with him and I just thought you know, that's a super simple experience and it's a simple use of the tech, but it's such a profound, you know, such a profound use of it and such an amazing use case for it. And I think, you know, there's a lot of things you can introduce into VR that make it very complicated, very inaccessible, you know, very unscalable. But when you strip it back to basics, it's like, who's your audience? What are you trying to achieve? Like if it's just kind of giving someone a really beautiful bucket list experience that's one thing if it's you know trying to scare someone by putting them through a, a horror experience that's another but it, I think you can work with the limitations on that so I think that was a bit of a roundabout way of answering that question but you know it just shows you that I've worked with people right you know from people that you know are bed bound all the way through to people that are literally in like some kind of crazy harness that are like flying around a room like <laughs> in a headset so there's there's a real spectrum Oh, that's so lovely and really wholesome and really special. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I think we've got one or two questions left and we're going to, have to finish, unfortunately. Um, but are you able to please talk a little bit more about um, the routes into XR, whether uh, we should be considering apprenticeships or alternative ways uh, into the platform? Oh, yeah, good question. Um, it really depends. I would say, like I say, um, if you have the means to to get yourself along to some of these events, a lot of the XR industry hangs out at these events, right? So like building a network is like, an, you know, it's unfortunate about our industry, but like it is, it is kind of a people driven industry. So it's not a bad idea to get yourself along to some of these events. And again, like have a look in your local area. There might be some stuff going on, like get, get surrounded by people that are also excited about this stuff. Like, you know, create a little tribe of people that you might kind of um, work with to make some kind of experimental stuff. So that's one side of things, like just try and get yourself into, and, and that doesn't necessarily have to be physical either. You could even be part of, you know, there's some like um, online kind of experiences that you can do in places like Fortnite and Roblox, these kind of up and coming gaming platforms that are also being used for like the future of kind of entertainment. Um, so you can kind of start there. You can um, reach out to people on LinkedIn or Twitter or Instagram, like a, a lot of people that kind of um, I talk back and forth with on social media are people that listen to my podcast and were like, oh, wow, like that's given me a good idea on how to start in this industry. And now we kind of have a, have a kind of um, a back and forth online. So people are pretty nice in this industry and they're, they're very, um, you know, uh, obviously it's never good to feel entitled to someone's time, but a lot of people in this industry are good people that will make the time. Um, so that's another way. And then in terms of like internships, apprenticeships, there are VR specific companies. You know, I'm um, I'm not doing like a load of um, kind of uh, big projects with Cats Not Peas at the moment because I'm busy um, with a slightly different kind of 
hat on at the moment with um, a large uh, consultancy, but there are plenty of other companies that are, right? So there's like a company in London called No Ghost that are amazing. They're an Emmy award winning VR studio. They made like uh, the Wallace and Gromit um, immersive experience that just launched at Venice this year. So reach out to these people, see if there's a way of, you know, kind of working from afar. But the thing that all of these people will ask is kind of, you know, what are you bringing to the table? And it can't just be like, I've got a great idea. So show that you've kind of like, you've, you've thought about things, show that you've done your research on these people or these companies and, and see where you can add value, right? And then if, if you know, I think I credit my VR success to the fact that I was, kind of curious enough and you know fortunate enough I'm not going to say that I wasn't fortunate to be able to afford to buy a little 360 camera back in the day if you can get your hands on the tech that's going to go a long way for me personally like I know if someone has gone out of their way and spent hours of their time trying to build something even if it's a bit crap right even if it's super super basic right that shows me that that person was so passionate about this they were so excited about their idea that they were willing to invest their time in it so i would say that if you do have the means or you like have the free time i know it's not always possible but if you can try and just start building stuff whether it's using like the blockade kind of tool to do like use gen ai imagery to pull together a little bit of like a storyboard of what your idea might be or whether it's starting to get a sense of like how to build stuff in unity and blender if it's like watching a load of youtube videos on how to kind of create your first uh, spatial video using like the 180 camera on your on your phone there's loads of ways to get started. And I would say if you're the kind of person that takes the initiative and kind of um, uh, gives you, builds your own momentum by getting started like that, that goes a long way in the industry. Real. Thank you, Alex. Um, and final question, this is from me and the team. Uh, what are your predictions for the future of uh, the landscape of film and uh, XR and VR? Just a just a small little question to throw at the end there. Love that. Love that. What are my predictions? I think this medium will be a huge part of our future. And and I don't I don't think it will replace film. I don't think it will replace TV. I don't, it's not like that, right? We still have radio and theater, even though we have film, right? So it's its own thing. But I think it's undeniable that this is going to be a huge part of kind of the entertainment format. Now, in what what does that look like in five to 10 years time? I would say it's probably something like secret cinema, that kind of like collaborative. It's kind of like a collaborative, immersive theatre experience that to me feels like the most obvious place that this stuff kind of goes. But with Apple getting into the game, I mean, you know, Apple themselves are creating content, right? I don't think it's a million miles away to think that Apple might have their own immersive originals. And all of a sudden, if that starts to happen and you start to get A-list celebs and you start to get A-list IP and you start to build these, then it becomes like a whole other thing, right? Because you're going to get this whole um, new audience kind of move into this space. So I think where this goes is it's going to continue to develop. It's not going to be overnight especially in VR, like no one wants to wear this for more than an hour, really, unless you're a hardcore gamer. So it's going to take a while. But where it goes to is probably the future of collaborative, immersive storytelling. Um, and I think that's super exciting. And I think just one point to kind of, you know, I already kind of alluded to it in a previous question. People ask me like, how, do, like, you know, this stuff has been around for a while and it's not, gone super super mainstream so why do you still have belief in this and I say do you know how much money is spent on Fortnite and Roblox as platforms Fortnite they made us I think it's something like five billion in digital skins for your avatar in this gaming experience right Ariana Grande did a, a, a live concert on Fortnite that had something like 20 million concurrent users at the same time that's not a game that's an entertainment medium. And as soon as storytellers develop the skills and develop the kind of ideas that work in that spatial medium, you know, Roblox itself has just launched on headset. You know, Roblox has like, I think it's something like 60 million daily active users, very young demographic, but 60 million daily active users. They've just launched on headset. 
What does it mean when 60 million people all of a sudden have a way of experiencing these spatial platforms in an immersive way? It's undeniable to me that at some point there is going to be an intersection between what they're doing on these kind of virtual world platforms to what's happening right now in immersive. And again, the hardware is going to get better. It's going to get cheaper. There's going to be more people that come into the industry. There's going to be more money that comes into the industry, which means the medium is going to go faster. And at some point there will be a crossroads. And I think that that's probably maybe like three to five years away. But when it happens, I think it's going to be a fundamental shift in, in the entertainment sector. So again, I couldn't be more all in on this medium. And I think other people should be as well.